Right then guys, it's PSL here for the ninth episode in my Stuart Manager career mode on Grand Prix World. Now quickly, I do just want to apologise for the lack of uploads recently on this series. A combination of F1 2018 being released combined with a couple of other things means that the upload rate slowed down to a point lower than I'm really happy with and lower than I really expected. I mean, by this point in time, I was hoping to have another two episodes released, at least another episode, but unfortunately it just wasn't to be. But anyway, we are now here with this episode, the ninth episode in this series. And just to remind you, last time out we had the Hungarian Grand Prix, and as you can see, Michael Schumacher won. And in fact, it was so nearly an incredibly successful race for us, although having said that, to still finish in seventh, that's a decent finish for us. But anyway, Michael Schumacher won, Frentzen second, Alexander Wurtz in third, Jean Lacy for Sauber finished in fourth. Fantastic race for Lacy, also for Luca Padoa. It was a race where he didn't suffer a reliability issue or be disqualified. So in that sense, it was successful for Luca Padoa, and scoring two points is just a nice bonus, really. Jacques Villeneuve took sixth, Rubens Barrichello, as I said, in seventh. Barrichello beat, on raw pace and raw pace alone, Giancarlo Fisichella and Mika Hakkinen. In fact, the race was really bad for McLaren. David Coulthard retired from the Grand Prix. The only, the only crumb of comfort for McLaren and Mika Hakkinen is that Hakkinen set the fastest lap of the Grand Prix. But, well, that race meant that in the Constructors' Championship, Ferrari overtook McLaren. Ferrari now leads the Constructors' Championship nine points ahead of McLaren. In the Drivers' Championship, it's much the same story. Michael Schumacher has taken the lead in the Drivers' Championship nine points ahead of Mika Hakkinen. I just don't know what's happened to McLaren recently because at the start of the season, McLaren were the team to beat. They were getting all the race wins and then later on in the season, Michael Schumacher and Ferrari, they were having lots of disqualifications and reliability issues. But recently, Ferrari, they've improved their reliability and stopped getting disqualified and McLaren, they just lost all the performance they had. Now, look in the top right corner of the screen, you can see the amount of spending money we've got. Currently, it's $370,000. But keep an eye on that, because in a second I'm going to cut away to do the usual stuff I do off screen. The usual stuff which I've already explained how it works, my strategy, my approach for the time being, you know. Um, things such as employing staff, things such as vehicle maintenance. You already know how that works and my approach with it, so I don't really need to show it. But, because I'm going to do that off screen and, well, employing people initially doesn't really cost anything, usually, anyway. Vehicle maintenance does cost money, so keep an eye on that $370,000 because very soon that amount of money is going to be reduced by quite a significant amount. And as you can see, I've spent $150,000 manufacturing spare parts. And that's only three spare parts, which isn't even enough to fully repair our cars, because we need two spare parts, one each, for both Barrichello's and Magnussen's car to repair the wear. But they also need one spare part each to repair the damage. That's four spare parts needed, but we can only manufacture three. Well, we can manufacture another one, but we'd have to pay $89,500 as opposed to $50,000 to compensate for the lack of staff. $220,000, that's not enough to travel to the Belgian Grand Prix. So on the face of it, we're screwed. We're actually not, but... I mean, we need to do some fundraising, and I have tried to delay fundraising for as long as possible. I was actually hoping that we would be able to go through the entirety of this season without raising money, but I think that's near as damn it impossible. San Marino, a profit of $100,000. Spain, a profit of $32,000. 
Then the losses really start coming in. Monaco, we lost $100,000. Canada, $215,000. Even France. Traveling to France, that's not all that far, but we still lost $95,000. Even the British Grand Prix, the Grand Prix with the lowest travel costs, we still lost $17,000. Now, the reason for this is... Firstly, over the course of the season, I've been employing more people. I mean, let's not forget, at the start of the season, we had about 40 people in each of our departments. We've now got about 50 people in all of our departments. We would have more, but as you can see, people keep resigning from our departments, which, well, that's just an unfortunate side effect of the low staff morale. So not only is productivity bad because of the staff morale, but it productivity keeps getting worse because people keep resigning. Not only have the costs gone up as the season's gone on, but the sponsorship income has gone down. So this is a graph of the amount of money we've got in sponsorship income per race. Because as you can see, the estimated sponsorship amount we should be getting per race is just over 1.2 million. That's of course, you know, HSBC's income divided by 16 and Ford's income and um, all the rest of it. Unfortunately, as you can see, the support most of these sponsors and suppliers have for us is zero. Now, I think that's partly affected by our lack of on-track performance, but as I've said over the course of this season, I don't know why any of these companies would expect Stuart to be doing well this season, given, well, given their past and given... I don't know why you'd expect Stuart to be scoring points regularly or doing better than we are, to be honest. But anyway, the only two sponsors that have above zero support for us are HP and Vistian, but that's only because they are going to be sponsoring us next season. So we spent a bit of time this season talking to them for negotiations. So that's increased their support, but it also means they're going to have the lowest support of any sponsor or supplier next season. The first way, and really the best way, of raising money is through selling shares. Now, the current price for 1% of Stuart is $95,000. $95,000 for 1% of Stuart. Because as you can see, I own 100% of Stuart. As long as I own at least 51% of the team, I can't be sacked. If you sell over 50% of the team, apparently, well, you can be sacked, but apparently it, it is also quite easy to be sacked. It's evident that you're not really intended to sell more than 51% of the team because you can be sacked quite easily. So the idea is that you keep at least 51% of the team. So selling shares, it's a brilliant way to raise money because you get the money instantly and you never have to pay it back. But it's also a limited resource because if you own less than 51% of the team, you've had it. And of course, that's exactly what happened to Ron Dennis a couple of years ago. Ron Dennis, of course, was placed on gardening leave at the end of 2016. And I think... I think at the time he was placed on gardening leave, he owned only 25% of McLaren. Because back in the day, Ron Dennis owned, I think, all of McLaren, or certainly was a majority shareholder. But over the years, he sold different slices of McLaren off to different people and different companies. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, or I think actually technically Daimler-Benz, owned 40% of McLaren, including in 1998 when this game is set. But yes, I mean, you know, fast forward to 2016, Ron Dennis only owned 25% of McLaren. The other shareholders collectively weren't happy with how Ron Dennis was managing the team and they removed him. Because Ron Dennis tried to buy back his job. He tried to buy back shares in McLaren, but no one was selling. So that's how Ron Dennis lost his job. Or another example, still to this day, Williams, the Williams family still owns 52% of Williams. So Claire Williams can't be removed from her job, from team principal. But anyway, yes, selling shares is the best way to make money because you can raise money and you never have to pay it back. 
But to add a bit of challenge to this career mode, I'm going to see if I can take Stuart to the top of Formula 1 whilst still owning 100% of the team. So I want to see if I can take them to the top by myself. I'm going to take out a $6.5 million loan on a 35, 35% interest rate for 16 races. The interest rate is higher if you want the loan to be longer. It's also higher depending on not necessarily the team you are, but the state your team is in. Because, I mean, if we try to take out a loan with Ferrari, they'd probably offer us a 16 race loan with an interest rate of probably only 10 or 15 percent because Ferrari are a much more financially secure team. We're not. Whereas Minardi, their Minardi's financial position is even more perilous than ours. So Minardi, they would probably be offered a loan with an interest rate of a minimum of probably 40 percent. It could honestly be 50 percent. But anyway, let's take out this loan. $6.5 million over the course of 16 races. That means we'll have to pay $2.2 million in interest. So that is... Okay, it doesn't say yet. So let's take out the loan. Yes, there you go. That is a repayment of $552,000 per race. Now, we're already losing $100,000 per race, so... Yes, we've got $6.7 million. That's fantastic. You know, that's enough to pay our wages, our salaries, the travel costs. That's enough easily to get us through the season. But we're having to pay back, or we're losing, between races, not $100,000 like we were before, but now $600,000 per race. So you could think of it, you know, that we've got... 6.5 million dollars but we have to pay over the course of 16 races 2.2 million for that or you could look at it another way and that is for the next well for the next four races at least because i mean next season i'm hoping we'll be making profits per race ordinarily but for the next four rounds of the season yes we've got a lot more money but we're losing it at six times the rate that we were previously so you know, we're in a good financial position, but it's going to get worse very quickly. That's why I took out the loan at the end of the season, because if I took this loan out at the start of the season, at the rate at which we would have lost money, I think this team would have been broke. Oh, that's fantastic. Right. I wasn't expecting this to happen, but we have been given by Bridgestone a new hard tyre compound, which is... Well, it's maximum resilience. That's fantastic for a hard tyre. It's also... It's also, what, slightly stiffer and one higher on temperature. So I guess... I guess temperature would mean it's easier to raise up to the correct temperature, but also less likely to overheat. Less temperature sensitive. But yes, now that we've got the money to travel to spa Francochamp, let's head our way over there. Oh yes, a dry qualifying session, that is fantastic, because that will give us an opportunity to road test our brand new dry tyres, our brand new dry hard tyres. Although, this is cute, because we're overjoyed with having an upgrade to the car, but the top teams probably bring an upgrade to every Grand Prix. They certainly have the potential to, because they've got more staff, a higher staff morale, so much higher staff productivity, greater funding, and the deals, the R&D deals, to be able to improve their parts whenever they want. So they can and probably do bring an upgrade to every single Grand Prix. But anyway, we'll see if the dry tyres do us proud. But then again, as I said, lots of the other teams could have improved their tyres. Certainly, Goodyear seem to have improved their tyres, or at the very least, their tyres are the ones to be on in, in spa Francorchamps because Michael Schumacher took pole position, both Williams in second and third, Heinz Held Frensen getting the better of Jacques Villeneuve. 
Well, certainly Williams have got the better of Benetton on this occasion. Williams in second and third, Benetton in fourth and fifth. Damon Hill in sixth, Luca Badoa in seventh. Then you finally find a McLaren. Mika Hakkinen down in eighth. David Coulthard down in tenth. Ralph Schumacher got the better of David Coulthard. Jordan overall beat McLaren. Mika Salo banned after qualifying. What's what's happened there? In fact, where is Denis is twelfth. Ordinarily, the only reason you would be banned after qualifying is due to you running a driver aid. But I would be surprised if Arrows are running a driver aid because well, it it would just be strange because Arrows don't have the greatest funding or the most skilled staff because driver aids aren't really something you should prioritize there there's something they're really sort of the last resort you know once you've um, once you've already finished working on technology upgrades that's you know your spare staff you put on driver aids you wouldn't we wouldn't manufacture a driver aid because it's too high risk for potentially not even that much of a gain, but Arrow seemingly have done it. Well, Mikasalo's been banned after qualifying for some reason, so that means he will not be taking part in the Belgian Grand Prix. So we've gone from a dry qualifying session to a very dry race. We're in Belgium, we're at Spa Francorchamps, and it's not going to rain all race weekend. Very odd. So, yes, we don't need to do anything else, and, well, 14th and 15th in qualifying isn't the best. However, Rubens Barrichello finished 7th in the Hungarian Grand Prix. His, his speed was brilliant. He was quicker than Fizzy Keller, than Mika Hakkinen around Hungary. I mean, that was a real shock. And since then we've got a tyre upgrade, and this is spa Francorchamps. and that race, that track, can throw up a shock, even in dry conditions, so let's see what happens. Actually, all in all, not a bad race for us, 8th and 10th, Rubens Barrichello finished in 8th, Jan Magnussen in 10th, neither driver was lapped, and I think that might have something to do with the fact that the winning driver was Jacques Villeneuve. Jacques Villeneuve won the 1998 Belgian Grand Prix. Alexander Wurtz once again in second place. Only, only two tenths of a second back. That would have been, that would have been a brilliant finish to watch. Damon Hill in third place. Michael Schumacher in fourth. Luca Badoa in fifth. Only seven seconds behind his teammate. And what's the difference in wages between Michael Schumacher and Badoa? Millions, millions difference. And all that for 7 seconds in the race. Pedro Diniz finished the Grand Prix in 6th. He beat Mika Hakkinen, who finished in 7th. I mean, that's bad. But it's an improvement from qualifying. That's, that's the real tragedy. Rubens Barrichello, for the second race in a row, beat Giancarlo Fisichella in a Benetton. Really impressive, beat him by over two seconds. Magnussen was only three seconds back. Oh, David Coulthard disqualified. Okay, I will actually look up where he finished because... Well, as we know, there was that one race where Luca Badoa was disqualified but finished on the road in second. And bearing in mind McLaren's apparent drop in pace, it would be nice to see if McLaren lost points through Coulthard's disqualification. And is there anything else to talk about? Not really. I mean, the only thing I will say is Deniz finished in sixth. Now, Mika Salo was disqualified. He was banned from qualifying, presumably due to running a driver eight. Now, Arrow's scoring points isn't... It isn't that uncommon or unlikely. It's not a regular occurrence, but Arrows can and have, on multiple occasions this season, scored points. 
But to do it, he had to beat Mika Hakkinen, both of our drivers, Fizzy Keller, Alesi. Solo, I believe, was running a driver aid in qualifying. And I think Diniz was in qualifying and the race because that would explain his brilliant pace in the Belgian Grand Prix. Sixth in the Narrows is difficult to explain unless he's broken the rules. In the Drivers' Championship, there isn't really much to report. Michael Schumacher has pulled further away from Mika Hakkinen, and now the gap between the top two in the Drivers' Championship is 12 points, more than a race win's worth of points. In fact, it gets worse for Mika Hakkinen because Hakkinen, yes, he's still in second, but he's only two points ahead of Alexander Wurtz. And if the recent form carries on, Alexander Wurtz quite easily, and probably in the next race, will overtake Mika Hakkinen in the Drivers' Championship. Ferrari, I think have, not securely, but they've got quite a sizeable lead in the Constructors' Championship. I just don't see McLaren beating them. McLaren is still second in the Constructors' Championship, 14 points back, but to be perfectly honest, I think it's more likely Benetton or Williams would beat Ferrari because McLaren have just dropped off. But Benetton, well, Alexander Wurtz recently has done fantastic, Fisichella less so, but Williams, both drivers have done very well. So, I don't know, but Benetton, they are 17 points behind Ferrari. Williams are 20 points back. There's only three rounds in the season left to go, and really, without Michael Schumacher's pace just dropping completely, or without a return of the lack of reliability or disqualifications, I don't really see any way in which Ferrari could lose the Constructors' Championship. I will be honest, I'm not sure whether it's impressive or stupid, but certainly it's interesting that Arrows already, before the end of the first season, have manufactured a drive raid. I mean, they haven't run it by the FIA. I mean, well, let me just check, because... Yeah, the only registered FIA-approved driver aids are Williams' traction control system and Ferrari's power brakes. So every other driver aid that is being used hasn't been run by the FIA. That doesn't necessarily mean it's illegal, but... Well, I think it does, because I think if the FIA catch you using it, they disqualify you, regardless of whether they'd consider it to be legal or not. Because, as we know, Ferrari kept getting disqualified for having a driver aid which the FIA told us was legal. It's, it, that was weird. Anyway, what else is there? Ferrari... Ferrari must now be certain to win this year's Constructors' Championship. Completely agree. More bad news concerning Stewart. Arrows. Arrows have gone into a partnership with Ford. In fact, actually, Ford currently have only struck a deal with one team, and they haven't got a works deal yet. How many teams haven't got engine deals? Most of the top ones have. McLaren have, Prost have, Ferrari have, we have, Stewart. Arrows have, Williams and Benetton, so... Sauber haven't. They're probably the top team that hasn't. In fact, Jordan hasn't, have they? Neither's Jordan. Okay. McLaren has signed a joint venture deal with Total, Total Fuel. Minardi and Goodyear have entered into a partnership. In fact, that's, that's not bad. A partnership. So that's one above a customer for Minardi, so that's good. But I think it means, again... Yet again, we're going to be using the same tyres as Minardi, because this year we're both using Bridgestones, and next year we're both switching to Goodyear. And we're... okay. Prost have signed a joint venture deal with AGIP, that's the fuel we're using next season. So, I mean, Prost... <sighs> Prost are... I think in 2000, Prost could be the team to beat. Potentially. They're certainly going to be up there. They're going to... I mean, this season they still haven't scored a point. Next season I reckon they'll be scoring points. They've got to Mercedes engines next season. 
Prost, it could be a flash in the pan, it could be a one season, two season thing, but I think Prost, even if just temporarily, could be a top midfield team at least. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I have been rated the least effective manager in Formula 1, which I would contest, but to be fair, when you've got that as a news story, the fact we've had to borrow money, and no other team had been reported to borrow money, I guess it doesn't really reflect all that well on me. And then you've got um, David Richards has been voted Manager of the Month. It's nice to see someone who isn't Jean Todd or Ron Dennis. David Richards, sort of fair enough. I mean, Wurtz has been doing brilliantly recently, Fisichella less so, but yeah, I mean, again, David Richards, I would say, not undeserving of the award. So let's, let's go with active suspension. We'll go for it systematically. So we'll go with the first one. Let's see if Arrows have got a active suspension. They've got something. And if Arrows have got it, I would really like to. Because right now, our biggest rivals are Arrows. And anyway, let's head on to the Italian Grand Prix. The 1998 Italian Grand Prix held at Monza. Let's see how we do in the qualifying session for the Italian Grand Prix. Slightly worse than we did in the Belgian Grand Prix, 16th and 15th for our two drivers. Michael Schumacher took pole position in front of the Tafosi. David Coulthard, I didn't actually check where he finished on circuit in the in the Belgian Grand Prix. I mean, he... well, he's finished second here, so he's clearly quick, but then again, Hakkinen's pace has also improved because he's in fourth, but just because... No, actually, I mean, this applies to every time I've... Every time one driver from one team has had a driver aid, I've always assumed that the other driver is also running a driver aid. Because in the last Grand Prix, Mikasalo was found to be running a driver aid illegally. That doesn't mean that Pedro Diniz was running a driver aid, but he did finish in sixth. So it's a bit suspicious. And David Coulthard potentially running a driver aid, that doesn't mean that Hakkinen also is. Schumacher, Coulthard, Fizzy Keller in third, splitting the two McLarens. In theory, this circuit should benefit, or should play to the strengths of McLaren. They're the only team running a Mercedes engine, the most powerful engine on the grid. What is this with backmarker teams, or bottom half teams, getting driver rates? Was it worth it because Jano Trulli's banned after qualifying won't even be taking part in the race? Well, okay, right, I just skipped through straight to the race. Didn't need any build-up, it was a dry Grand Prix, so, you know, no change in the weather, really. However, the race results are promising for at least a Constructors' Championship battle to happen. David Coulthard for McLaren won the Grand Prix. That's the first McLaren win for some time. Giancarlo Fisichella for second. That's another second place for Benetton. So Alexander Wurtz, in fact, I think Wurtz retired because he's not towards the front. Yes, an engine issue for Alexander Wurtz. Hakkinen! Hakkinen in 21st, right. With an electronics issue. Okay, I might... I'll check up on that as well. After this Grand Prix, I'll check up where Hakkinen was at the point at which he retired. Because, I mean, Coulthard won. And yeah, he did qualify ahead of... Hackenham, but the qualifying times were incredibly close between the McLaren teammates. But even still, McLaren, 10 points they've gained from this Grand Prix. 10 points for the Constructors' Championship. Giancarlo Fisichella, 6 points for Benetton. Michael Schumacher in third, that's 4 points for himself in the Drivers' Championship. Which, well, he's finished ahead of all of his immediate Drivers' Championship contenders. Because Wurtz retired, Hackenham retired, and even Jacques Villeneuve finished down in 6th. So in the Drivers' Championship, it's comfortable for Michael Schumacher. Michael Schumacher has, near as damn it, won the Drivers' Championship. There's only two races left to go this season. The only drivers that can mathematically win the Drivers' Championship at this point 
are Michael Schumacher, Mecca Hakkinen, and who would have guessed this at the start of the season, Alexander Wurtz. There's 20 points up for grabs. And Schumacher's got a 16-point lead over Hakkinen, an 18-point lead over Alexander Wurtz. It is mathematically possible that any of the top four teams could win the Constructors' Championship, but it is still entirely possible that McLaren could win the Constructors' Championship. McLaren, I think, have refound their form. David Coulthard winning a Grand Prix. Hakkinen, knowing Hakkinen, he probably set the fastest lap of the Grand Prix. I will check that out. And Benetton, they just keep finishing in second. That's good up to a point, but if if Rari suffer reliability issues, those second places will be crucial. Okay, so looking back over the Belgian Grand Prix, as it turns out, David Coulthard's disqualification didn't really change all that much. Now, I know this lap chart can be slightly complicated to interpret, but long the short of it is that David Coulthard, car number 7, finished in 11th. Behind his teammates, so, you know... David Coulthard's disqualification doesn't really change much. Now, the Italian Grand Prix. Hakkinen retired. In fact, oh, on the fastest lap front, Hakkinen didn't really fare too well, actually. But Hakkinen retired. It's also... Alexander Wurtz is another driver I want to look out for. So, Hakkinen is car number eight. Let's look at that first. So, car number eight. In fact, what lap did he retire on? That would be helpful to know. He retired on lap 9, actually very early on. So on lap 9, Hakkinen, car number 8, was... Well, he was 4th. Car number 6 was... Oh no, he was in 3rd. He was in 3rd. That could have been a double podium for Benetton. Because Fizzy Keller was already in 2nd by that point, the blue line. All across second, and the blue line for Vert was in third, but then he retired. Jordan has gone into a partnership with Mugen Honda. Okay, not really that exciting. Minardi has gone into a partnership with Ford. And, whoa, Sauber! No, that's the more interesting one. Sauber has gone into a partnership with Mercedes-Benz. Right, okay, let me just check, because I think Minardi have got a customer deal with Ford, so that is... Oh, oh, okay, we've filled up the deal completion bar with Bossini. Okay, so we will actually fill up all of our sponsor slots this season, that's good news. But, okay, so this season, have Minardi got a customer deal? Yes, Minardi have gone from a customer deal to a partner deal, so that's an improvement for Minardi. I mean, that's going to save them... I don't know exactly, but seven, eight million dollars in costs. So that's good for Minardi, but I mean, look at this. I mean, Jordan, you know, Mugen Honda to Mugen Honda, partner to partner. Nothing's changed there, but look at that. Sauber. Sauber, a Mercedes powered team. So, I mean, I'm sure people, I'm slightly disappointed. I'm sure other people are that. McLaren still went with Mercedes and Ferrari still went with Ferrari. That's slightly disappointing. But Prost have gone with Mercedes. Sauber have gone with Mercedes. And Sauber traditionally has links with Ferrari. Of course, they couldn't because, you know, Ferrari have already signed a deal with themselves and I've already got a part in the deal with Ferrari. So Sauber, if they wanted one of those top two engines, they had to go with Mercedes. So then guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode, if you did be sure to leave a like, comment down below, and I'll see you guys in the next episode, the 10th episode in this series, and it will be a special one, not just because we're getting into double figures, you know in terms of episode numbers, that's not really interesting, what is interesting is the fact we will be finishing off the 1998 season, the driver's champion and more interestingly, because it's more open and up for grabs, the Constructors' Champion will be crowned in the next episode. So I'm looking forward to the next episode. I hope you guys are, and I'll see you guys then.